afternoon uh, from flood ravaged uh, Brisbane and a warm welcome to a, a joint event presented by the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Queensland and the Asia Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, AP4D. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll be discussing uh, around the topic, conducting a discussion around the topic of building Australian partnerships in Southeast Asia, coordinating development, defence and diplomatic instruments for effective security and governance. Uh, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the land on which uh, I'm hosting here tonight. And in our region, that is the Yagara and Turabal people. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and merging. I'd like to um, introduce our, our wonderful panel tonight. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to turn to Melissa Connolly Tyler. Now, welcome, Melissa. She's the program lead at the Asia Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, as I said, AP4D, as it's known by its acronym. It's a new platform for constructive dialogue and future focused debate across the development, diplomacy and defence communities. Melissa served as National Executive Director of the AIIA, Australian Institute of International Affairs for 13 years. She joined the University of Melbourne in 2019 as a Director of Diplomacy at AsiaLink and then as a Research Fellow in the Asia Institute. Melissa remains an Honorary Fellow at the Asia Institute. She was recognised as a Fellow of the AIIA in 2019 for her contribution to Australia's international affairs. So warm welcome to Melissa. I'd next like to introduce uh, Miss Sharon Cowden. Sharon's a former Australian Federal Police Commander who has worked offshore in operational training and liaison capacities. Her last posting was at the, as the Australian Federal Police Commissioner's Senior Representative in Southeast Asia. After nearly 36 years with the AFP, Sharon has commenced a second career consulting in the law and justice sector and for the last year has been the transnational crime and border security advisor on the DFAT led Mekong Australia partnership on transnational crime. Sharon has a strong interest in the area of capacity building for the civil power and advocates for connecting with the Indo-Pacific region on the basis of shared areas of interest. So a warm welcome to you, uh, Sharon, the evening. Now I'd like to convey apologies from our third palace, uh, panelist, Ms. Dallas Dow Dowsett and as I've said that, I have rain uh, pouring down uh, here again, as you know, uh, many uh, Brisbaneites are, are dealing, contending with the, with the flood uh, emergency at the moment, which is ongoing in New South Wales. So I'm going to turn to you, uh, Melissa, as the program lead at AP4D, and, and I, let's hear a little bit more about what the APD, AP4D is all about and what, what it aims to achieve. So over to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Look, and, and thank you. It'd be great to have an opportunity to introduce ourselves as an initiative. Um, but, but first, I should say a huge thanks to you, Greta, for pulling this together. We really appreciate the chance to have this fascinating discussion and I'm happy to enjoy this female panel. So thank you. Um, I'm, I'm speaking today from the land of the Anawan people and the Armadale. So we are a bit higher and not as flood ravaged. And uh, yeah, real, real sympathies to everyone who's dealing with that at the moment. Um, I'm going to take you through, I suppose, quickly just what AP4D is as a new initiative to give you an idea about it. And it is very much in, in that way that Sharon's talking about it as shaping the shared future between Australia and the region. So we were formed uh, really only just a, a bit over a year ago now when uh, a number of organisations from across development, diplomacy and defence said, we think in a difficult, contested world, we need all the elements of Australia statecraft working together if we're going to have an impact. So it's a fairly simple insight, but I think it's a very powerful one. And what happened, I think, surprisingly quickly, as we got a lot of significant people behind it as an initiative. Um, so our co-chairs, uh, Mark Purcell, the head of ACFERD, and Professor Michael Wesley from the University of Melbourne. And then, you know, fantastic people from each of the three sectors saying, this is a good idea, let's see what we can do with it. Now, what's, I suppose, even less usual is we managed to get some early funding, which is fantastic. So we were funded by the Australian Civil and Military Centre, which is part of the defence portfolio, to do a one-year pilot program looking at applying this 3D approach, the defence diplomacy development approach, to our key relationships, first looking at Southeast Asia for six months, and then looking at the Pacific. 
And the basic idea is we bring together people from the three communities, get them to look at what are the issues, what are the policy options, and then we come up with ideas that we can then put into the policy space with decision makers, with you know, advisors, um, parliamentarians, uh, government departments, to say, here are some of the ways that you could be working. So the process we went through over the six months for the Southeast Asia uh, program uh, was, I suppose, quite intense, extensive and intensive. Uh, we started off with diagnostics, talking to people in the region about what are the key issues, talking to Australian experts on what we should be focusing on. We then had a big dialogue and we got great people from across all of the sectors. Um, from that, we identified five key issues that we'd focus on and um, more than 40 people then put up their hand and said, yes, I'd like to be working in a, in a working group looking at those issues. And both Sharon and Greta, thankfully for me, put up their hands and uh, shared their expertise. Um, we got a chance to get government feedback as part of the process, which was fantastic. So we had a first assistant secretary and two assistant secretaries from DFAT and Defence um, who could give feedback. What were they finding interesting? What did they want to hear more about? And from that, we produced options papers. And they are a little bit different, and I've got to admit that. Um, what people naturally want to do is they want to talk about the past and say what went wrong. <laughs> and if you just ask people, you know, let's talk about our relationships in Southeast Asia, that's what they'll naturally do. So this process was all about saying, we're going to be positive, we're going to be future focused, we're going to be solutions oriented. And that's a different space for people to work in, to ask them, what's our vision? Where do we want our relationship with Southeast Asia to be? And then what are some pathways to get there? So what we brought out earlier, so yes, earlier this month uh, was we brought out five options papers looking at those key issues, recovery and growth, climate leadership, being a security partner, um, being a catalyst for uh, civil military cooperation, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, and one that looked at how Australia could be a strategically coherent actor across all parts of statecraft. And then we put that together into a synthesis report and presented it. And look, what's been fantastic has been the response we've got. Um, I think in many ways, we judge our success by the attention that we get to the ideas. Um, that's our value add. We're not the content experts. It's people like Greta and Sharon who are the content experts. What we're about is creating a platform that can take those ideas into a space they need to go. So the launch was huge, uh, more than 160 people attended. Um, both the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Shadow Minister for International Development and um, Shadow Minister Assisting Defence um, spoke, which was fantastic. Um, and as well as that, we've had real interest with private briefings to lots and lots of both parliamentarians to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, um, I think five ministerial and shadow ministerial officers, and then major departments, state that defence, PMC, uh, federal police, health, I think I've forgotten one, but, and of course we're trying to take the messages out to a wider audience. So we've, you know, you'll see, I think there's, since then there's been a piece in the interpreter, another piece coming out in strategist this week in the conversation, trying to share those ideas. Um, and I hope many people saw the one that was in the Australian Outlook, AWA's own wonderful publication, which really took the messages from this civil military paper. So that's me trying to give a quick introduction to who we are and what our value add is, which is trying to be a platform to amplify good messages and good ideas from across the sectors. Thanks very much, Melissa. I think the, the issue here is about the timing or you know getting the timing right and, 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 and attracting the ear of policymakers. Now we've seen since the paper, we have a conflict in, in Europe, uh, you know, highly concerning and destabilizing. We also worry about the implications for that uh, uh, on, on, on Taiwan. Why would Australian policymakers be receptive now to your recommendations on how to enhance our engagement with, with Southeast Asian states? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I think I would say Southeast Asia is always important to Australia. So in that sense, it never goes out of fashion, but there are times where it becomes more salient. And I think we've seen that a bit also, say, with the Pacific. You know, there was a period where Australia said, um, 
looked at what was going on with Pacific and said, oh dear, we've stepped back a little bit too much and other people are coming in. If we want to have an influence in the Pacific, we're going to have to step up. And I think the same realisation happened on Southeast Asia that um, we've been putting a lot of focus on the Pacific, which is great, but are we really paying enough attention to Southeast Asia? Um, I think, again, COVID, China, climate, there's all sorts of things that, that, that make the region important to us. But uh, I think in particular, the COVID side showed that you can't really make a case now that we don't need to engage with the region, that I don't know, everything's fine and wonderful and it's going in a perfect trajectory and Australia doesn't really want to influence the region. I think we do. Um, there are different trajectories for Southeast Asia that are quite positive for Australia's security and prosperity and others that are really quite negative. And so if you think about, you know, the risks that can emanate to Australia from, you know, either from or through Southeast Asia, um, what happens if there's, you know, terrible inequality and unrest and extremist movements, you know, we care about Southeast Asia being successful. And maybe seeing COVID knock quite a lot of those positive trajectories into a different space, it became obvious that we can't just be a bystander. We absolutely have a stake in the region. And if we want to have a shared future, we have to really invest, really um, take seriously uh, the importance of Southeast Asia for us. Sharon, I'm going to turn to you because for those who are not familiar with this concept of, of civil military cooperation, I mean, you understand and I understand it because I'm a former defence, um, you know, uh, diplomat and an intelligence officer, etc. And you're, you had a long career with the Australian Federal Police. But what do we mean by um, civil military integration or, or civil military cooperation interoperability? Uh, and why is it so important for Australia's engagement with Southeast Asia? Yeah, thanks, Greta. And, and good evening to, to you and, and Melissa and, and everybody online. I suppose, um, look, civil military cooperation can be between citizens. It can be between communities and non-military institutions and their military counterparts. It can be, for example, police working with military in a range of response situations. But it can also be when the civil power um, or the, the situation or the event requires um, the skills that the military have. And, and in Southeast Asia, those skills, those logistical skills, those human resource skills, communications, often we see that the military is the first responder to all of those disaster um, events, emergency events, counterterrorism responses, the military are your first responder. Um, in, in many countries, um, or our own example, for example, we know that NGOs, government departments often have the skill sets that help along the, the, the chain of the events that need to be dealt with in those situations. So to get the best people at the table and use the best set of skill sets, you need that combination between um, both the military and the civil side, whether it's police, whether it's health, whether it's NGOs, whether it's community groups, both of those um, different skill sets coming to the table together, um, you know, make for a better outcome. You're on, on mute, Greta. My apologies again. Um, you mentioned police, Sharon, and uh, you made the point, you know, of course, it's it's beyond uh, you know, armed forces and police actors, isn't it? It's also about just in the security domain alone, you talked about aviation security officials and customs and border officials and a range of other what we might consider, you know, paramilitary uh, actors. Um, and you mentioned, I remember you mentioned about, you know, airport security. I mean, to, to, to deal with a, like a contingency or a security incident at airport, it takes a range of actors, doesn't it, to respond? It, it does. And, and I think um, what, we, what we know is that those pockets and skill sets and those people who are experts in their field, they come from various different departments, various different community groups. So whatever the situation, um, you, the, the um, dealing with it, you need the best people around the table. And so the military as first responders in Southeast Asia respond to a whole lot of, uh, of events because of their skill set, because they're across broadly across their countries, um, because they've got those logistics at hand, they've got those, 
the skill sets. But there are other players that, that might not be involved in those responses that would make the response a better, a better response. And that's yeah. what, what we're trying to maximise. That's right. And, and I'll turn back to Melissa because we, we made the point, Melissa, I think on first principles with this, this paper, and I'll remind our um, audience of the title, it was what does it look like for Australia to be a catalyst for Southeast Asian civil military cooperation? And it was tapping into that very future focus, solutions focused um, objective that you talked about, Melissa. But some of the first principles here was we were kind of uh, positing Australia as a sort of model, weren't, weren't we, Melissa? in terms of Australia does what we call in defence parlance, defence assistance to the civil community, and we have, you know, local government, and we're seeing that in Queensland now, Melissa and Sharon, you know, we have federal government, we have local government agencies, we have, you know, state government agencies, we have emergency services, we have, uh, you know, a range of actors that are involved in uh, disaster response and, and management of, of complex emergencies. But this, there was a, the first principles also about the civil society actors uh, wasn't it because in civil military cooperation inherent as Sharon said we have the police we have security force military actors but we also have civilian government agency personnel and so civil society actors what was so important Melissa about integrating those civil society actors in these recommendations well I would say that Australia has some very good models in terms of how you manage those really difficult questions about the role of military and society, the role of armed forces, um, a space for civil society and the civic dialogue. Um, I think those are those are things we've managed very well in Australia and, and um, in some ways they can be a model. Now I wouldn't push too hard because each of those questions are very difficult questions for every single society to work out by itself. Um, but I, I think if you are looking for something that has that shape, then there's a lot that Australia can do to model that sort of behaviour, the way that the military um, responds, understands its limits, um, and that civil society is actively promoted and given, you know, given great role. I mean, if we look across the region, uh, you know, Australia has to be concerned about the rising authoritarianism. Um, uh, this, we would say, um, isn't good for long-term stability, that if you want um, stable uh, and open region, you need um, a strong civil society alongside justice and policing. Um, you need civil society and civil society organisations to help deliver outcomes. And, and I'm included in you know, areas like um, you know, humanitarian and disaster relief. Um, in those areas, I think there's a real danger that because of military capacity, uh, it will be called upon over and over again as first responder. And that in itself is distorting some of those relationships in society. Um, so, you know, working particularly in those areas, on modelling positive civil military relations and within that humanitarian disaster relief, coming up with frameworks that, you know, guide and manage so that both civil and military actors are working side by side. Yeah, and indeed, Melissa, that was uh, viewed, uh, certainly viewed by, by some re governments in the region as being a fairly non-contentious area that civil society actors and NGOs can be integrated, particularly around disaster risk reduction, humanitarian assistance and, and disaster relief. I'm going to turn back to Sharon now, because Sharon, you're um, involved or, or providing advice, expert advice to the Mekong Australia partnership on transnational crime. Now we've talked about, we, we, we're feeling the effects of climate change, you know, right at this moment in Brisbane, and we know Southeast Asia, you know, the predictions are really dire from, from very reputable sources, you know, including the, the Asian Development Bank and the UN about coastal inundation and, and drought and, and uh, serious precipitation event, Sharon, but Sharon, you you worked, you know, significant experience. I mean, something that you raised in the paper was, you know, cryptocurrencies and about some of the, the security implications of, of emerging tech. There's a really wide spectrum of security threats faced by Southeast Asian states. Can you elaborate a little bit, Sharon, on that? Yeah, thanks, Greta. Well, look, I think 
we all know the world is getting smaller. We're very interconnected. Uh, the internet has done that for us. And so every, everything we deal with as far as risks ourselves, our neighbours are dealing with those same risks. Um, economic security is, imp is important in, in all of those countries. It's important for Australia. Um, the stability of their economy, whether it's um, at risk because of uh, cyber intrusion, whether it's at risk because of the banking sector with, with new emerging digital currencies. Um, the digital transformation in the Southeast Asia part of the region has um, just gone at such speed to the point where cryptocurrencies are being licensed in some of the ASEAN countries. Um, these things do and have the potential to, to impact on resilience. And they also need a different skill set to deal with them. So the security issue that they, that they um, deliver needs a different skill set. And, and again, who are your first responders in these sorts of situations? Obviously, good governance, strong institutional structures, international law, legal best practice, norms, all of those things are part of capacity building um, across the region, but, but knowing how to respond to those situ situations and what, what group could do that, uh, that that's something that uh, needs to be forethought and then how they operate together needs to be practised. And, and again, that capacity building needs to be part of our toolkit. Yeah, look, I, I'm going to turn to, to uh, Dallas, who couldn't join us uh, tonight. And Dallas is head of uh, U University of Queensland's Global Development Hard Hub and has significant experience in the provision of capacity building programs and short courses for uh, government personnel, but also CSO, NGO and uh, security forces in the region. And I've certainly worked on a, on a number of Australia Awards Indonesia programs myself, but she talked about this joined up concept which which we saw again and again Melissa you know in in the launch and in the discussions and about what that means uh, and to, and she provided you know it's the following key point so a joined up approach to capacity building we see a much more com comprehensive design to programs a greater opportunity to apply learnings from the various intersecting parts and actors it makes the experience for participants more authentic and applicable to the uh, real situations in which they work. It's never a single lens to an issue nor a single agency solution to a problem. And she went on to say that the, the you know, integrating a variety of, of agencies, multiple agency representation in participant cohort, builds collective learning, problem solving, establishes networks and builds the basis of ongoing professional collaboration. Uh, and this is this provides greater chances of success in managing security and humanitarian issues being faced now and in the future. So Sharon, in your experience, you know, one would think, and also Melissa, you know, one would think this is a no brainer, wouldn't we? We'd, you know, that joining up, you know, defense, diplomatic development arms, it, 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 isn't that aren't we already doing that so I'm going to turn to Sharon again Sharon why is this this is happening on some occasions obviously in both our, all of our collective experience but why isn't this happening enough do you think Sharon this, this joined up whole of government approach at the Australian end and not just the Southeast Asian end yeah look I think um, what Dallas said there is very is correct it, it is a better product when we're joined up and when our implementation um, is joined up. And why isn't it happening as much as it should? Well, I think in the Australian context, it's happening more and more and more. You know, a lot of the Australian government agencies don't work in, in a silo for any of their activities. They're all task forces. They're bringing the experts to the table. Um, you know, we know and we've seen that that works. Uh, we also know the world is, is much more complex and the knowledge base is, is much higher that you need that that broad base of people. Um, I think um, in the Southeast Asia context, that there, there's a way to go in um, how responsibilities are, are joined up. And, and um, I think in some areas, perhaps the economy, again, driven by international um, norms and international best practice, we're starting to see the breakdown of those silos. But but we know that more broadly that has to apply, particularly in this context. And, and the civil military uh, breakdown is a logical extension because of, of the first responding capability that military has for, for all variety of security, security outcomes across the region. 
Yeah, look, I have to say, certainly in my experience uh, as an Indonesian uh, specialist, uh, both as a practitioner and, and researcher, you know, you see again and again, the Indonesians have a term, they call it uh, ego sectoral, so the sectoral egos. And often, of course, you know, different agencies uh, don't want to share their power and influence, of course. And then you just have sometimes, you know, some poor coordination mechanisms. And I know, for example, working on the Indonesian courses, uh, with 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 you know uh, representatives from um, you know the police you know from from the big faith based organisations for a lot of civilian uh, government agency personnel Indonesian Red Cross they really liked the um, IDC or the interdepartmental committee model that we have in camera and I think that goes to Melissa some of that sort of modeling uh, and some things that Australia gets right um, in this space. Um, Melissa I'm just going to turn to some of the recommendations of the paper and I'll invite our audience to start uh, posing questions uh, when they're ready shortly. But I think two of the key recommendations, Melissa, one of them was indeed my own, so I'll claim credit for it, was is about well, how we could sell better, how we could uh, you know, better design a flagship uh, civil military focused short course program and better sell that. And we talked about it being a non-contentious area for civil military integration. And the other recommendation was about a regional military civil society uh, framework that could entail collaborative humanitarian assistance, disaster relief scenario development, uh, enhanced annual ADF regional presence deployments and so on. So could you just discuss that a little bit more, uh, Melissa? And, and also, uh, you know, given they were the, some very concrete, tangible recommendations, what's been the response of policymakers and parliamentarians to the recommendations? Yeah. Yes, so um, I put up on screen so people can see those. Um, look, I, I would say it, also in answer to your earlier question, um, that, that term, ego sectoral, is perfect because I think that's right. Anytime you create groups of humans who have a particular job, they will form their silos. They will develop a cultural way of working together. And you have to work quite hard to break those down, is my feeling. I think if you don't do anything, they will live in their silos. And that's why something like AP4D exists. Um, now, I should say, I think there are a lot of examples that really are trying to break those down. Um, and so one of the things we put in the papers was positive examples, like you know, Sharon knows very well with the Mekong Australia Partnership on Transnational Crime, where you've got bits of lots of different parts of Australian government all working together, uh, coordinated by the embassy, um, in a way that really shows what is possible and that you can break down those silos. So, I mean, from my side, when I've been presenting this to policymakers, I've been putting these as um, uh, realistic and achievable, as in you could do these two recommendations right now if you chose to. Um, for something like the capacity building side, that's really just a matter of saying, okay, the Australia Awards Program, the Defence Program, and the Home Affairs Program, and all the other programs, you guys have to talk to each other. You can do it. Um, and if they if they decide to, absolutely, they could design that. And I think that would be really positive um, modelling from us about bringing together the different parts of government and civil society. Um, the same for the regional military civil society framework. Um, again, a lot of this work already happens. It probably naturally happens at a military to military side. And so then what we've got to do is expand out from the Australian side and say, no, we don't just want this to be nil-nil. We want to make this much more civ nil And if I'm thinking, for example, of the Australian Civil Military Centre who, who has funded this program, I mean, the way they would put it is that when you're working on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, you want it to be um, as civilian as possible, as military as necessary. And if you have that as your framework, um, it's a whole different discussion. So yeah, my, I'm hoping that the fact that I presented it to everyone as realistic and achievable might mean that we see some movement in this area. But certainly we've sent this out and, and had um, individual briefing sessions with DFAT, with Defence, with PMC. Um, and I got the sense that the broad thrust of what we're suggesting 
is very, very much in line with uh, what, what we would like to achieve. Thanks, Melissa. So it's civilian as military, civilian as possible and military as necessary was the ethos. Yeah. And it's, it's one, one to remember, certainly. Um, Sharon, I'll turn to you again. I, I wonder if you could detail, I guess, both from your experience in Jakarta, what were some of the, the priorities and how you worked across different agencies in Jakarta, but certainly through the, the Mekong uh, Australia Partnership on Trans national crime. I'm sure our um, audience would like to, to hear a little bit uh, more on that partnership if possible. Yep, Greta, for sure. Um, look, I think um, when you're talking about transnational crime or security issues generally, there are a lot of, there are a lot of actors where capacity building um, could assist. There are certainly a lot of areas where, where um, silos, as um, Melissa said, could be broken down. Um, what the uh, Mekong Australia Partnership does is it looks across three particular transnational crimes in the Mekong area, drugs, financial crimes and child sex exploitation. And it looks at how the um, Australian government agencies can collectively um, not just build capacity, but look at research uh, gaps and look at ultimately better regional collaboration amongst those countries as well. So, so that's... Um, that's where, what that program is, is implementing. Um, the transnational nature of those crimes, though, um, also transposes into the security side, where you do often see, um, uh, as the, as the um, named first responder, the military in a lot of Southeast Asia countries. So there's definitely uh, a sc scope, and, and I would argue best practice, in, in models where that, that is joined up as outlined in the paper. Okay, Melissa, I'll turn back to you. The, the paper on um, enhanced civil military integration, that was just one of the options papers, wasn't it? And you're briefing policymakers and parliamentarians and others on, on a range of, of, I think, you know, quite dynamic recommendations here. Are you able to talk a little bit more about some of the other options papers and, and how they all kind of fit together? Absolutely. So I'm just sharing my screen now so you can see all of the topics we worked on. Um, as you say, it was very much a visioning process. What does it look like for Australia to be whatever the topic is, a good partner in Southeast Asia? So we focused on recovery and growth and the issues there were about how can we be a partner for health, education and economic cooperation. On climate leadership, we talked about uh, working with the region on a climate risk assessment um, and risk reduction, disaster risk reduction, and also I think a really positive vision of Australia as a renewable energy superpower to the region and what that would change in our basic relationships with the region. If we're supplying hydrogen and lithium and all of the things that are needed for um, Southeast Asia's green energy transition, um, what a difference that makes to the relationship. On the security partner side, uh, it was very much about seeing that hard security, you know, state security, traditional security, and human security are complementary and reinforcing. Um, if you look at what Southeast Asian leaders worry about, what keeps them up at night, they're often around this individual security, the human security side, um, because that's the foundation of stability in a society. If you don't have individual security, mm -hmm. everything else starts falling apart. And so not seeing it as distinct, you know, that human security is a development program, problem and, and that state security is a, a defence problem, but actually seeing that they are mutually reinforcing and um, have to work together. Uh, and then, yes, the last paper, as I mentioned, was more about how do you put this together across government? So if Australia wants to be a significant actor in Southeast Asia, how does it get all the elements of its statecraft working together in that direction? And so the focus was on having a single strategic 
um, aim. <laughs> so uh, the way, for example, the United Kingdom now has an integrated review, which brings together defence de development, diplomacy and trade um, in one paper, rather than the way we currently have separate white paper processes for each of those areas. So defence has one white paper, diplomacy has another, you know, uh, development has another. Can we bring it together and have much more a single strategic idea of what we want to achieve? Um, that then makes it easier for all parts of government to be heading in the same direction. And that group also suggested some very practical things like more movement of personnel to get to know other parts of government, more working group processes. You know, essentially, how do we build strategic coherence across the system? Um, so, yeah, again, all very exciting papers. And if I can send anyone to look at our website, it's asiapacific4d.com, and you'll see all of the papers are there to read. That point, Melissa, about strategic guidance and strategic coherence is, is really important, isn't it? And you talked about the UK uh, model because we we cited in the options paper about you know strategic guidance from the defence strategic update, uh, the DFAT white paper, and also that turns me to the Australian Federal Police, Sharon, um, and and how that kind of formulates uh, engagement priorities in the region. From your experience, Sharon, being posted to Jakarta and, and working in the federal police, what, what kind of guidance does the, the Australian federal police uh, formulate for, for its priorities, say, in Southeast Asia and in the region? Sure. Um, not, not dissimilar to, um, you know, Home Affairs or other departments that work in the region, they, they do have an international engagement strategy, which, which stands on its own on the on the priorities that the department wants to achieve by being placed in the region. I suppose this concept of, you know, a white paper that goes across a number of departments in, in this thematic area, in, in this case, Southeast Asia, um, actually, you know, starts the frame of reference for those priorities in a different way. So instead of looking singularly at their priorities, uh, looking at, at um, as, as Melissa said a few times, you know, solution-based for the actual problem as opposed to, um, uh, you know, the, the internal priorities, which of course should never be um, uh, not maintained as one of, the prior, one of the main focuses, but they should just be shaped um, with both bits of, um, of, of importance coming into, a, into one paper. And Melissa, is there, has there been any uh, uptake there on, on uh, some more coherent strategic guidance or, or planning processes that you're able to share with us? Uh, look, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I mean, um, it, it clearly won't, won't be something that's pursued till after the next election. Um, but I, I think there is a real debate about what's the right way to set Australia's next international strategy. Uh, the foreign policy white paper is widely recognised, including by the lead author, as now being out of date. <laughs> that <laughs> the, the world and, and particularly the you know the trends that were identified there have accelerated so much that we really do need something like a new foreign policy white paper. But I'd be saying, well, instead of just doing that, why don't we go down the sort of route of something like a UK integrated review, um, where we don't just look at one particular stovepipe, but we think about overarching what's our international strategy, what's our common vision, and then task each part of our statecraft to try to achieve that. Thanks. I should say, I'm not Sorry, sure if Tom. you can see it, Greta, but uh, I think we have a question from Rama. Um, he's put up his hand, but not put it in the question and answer. Oh, so, some reason I can't. Okay, I think I can see these. Is that with respect to the matrix management? I can just see that now. I know. I think it's an, an, a hand up for someone called yeah. Raman. Okay, some reason I can't see that yet. Uh, he's been very patient, so I thought I would mention. Yes. Shout out to you, Raman. Thanks for putting up your name early. Raman, if you could put your question in the Q&A, for some reason I can't see that. Uh, if Look, indeed, if, if Sharon or Melissa, you can see the question, please feel free to answer. I'm not sure why I can't see that. I can see one question there, um, Greta. Um, do, does these concepts reflect back to Harvard concepts of matrix management? I saw something of this in the RAF in the 1980s. 
Uh, look, I don't know if Melissa or Sharon would be well placed to, to answer that about matrix management, Sharon? Well, well I, I think it's a form of matrix management um, in that, you know, you m must go across and, and consider the priorities of, of many in, in your, you know, both in your risk mitigation, in your decisions, in your prioritisation. And the matrix then becomes departments if, if, if you wanted to, to sort of, or the white paper even has that matrix input. So it is a form of that theory um, for sure. Um, and, but I think it's also more than that um, because now we, we work in this world where we go across um, different sectors in, in, in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, whether it's the economic sector, the security sector, the health sector, you know, we, we, we're used to going across sectors. Okay, so if I'll ask people to put their uh, type in their questions in the Q and A, because for some reason I can't see, I can only see one um, question there. Um, Melissa, are you familiar with the matrix management model at all, or did that inform any bit. of the options paper? A little bit. Um, and look, I think again, I probably bring Sharon as an example of this. Often, I also get asked, "Oh, isn't this just whole of government?" And I say, "Well, yeah, it's a specific example of whole of government and trying to work across." So I, I think there's been, you know, there's been increased attention to this area for some time. Um, in our case at AP4D, we're we're not necessarily prescribing these are the only ways you can do it. What we're talking about as as our model is that you need to first um, respect and resource all arms of statecraft. So you don't want investment in one to be at the expense of the others. And secondly, you need them to coordinate um, to bring their complementary but distinct skills to bear on a common objective. And I think all parts of that are quite important. Um, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, we should all coordinate more, because if, for example, all of the funding and resources are going to only one arm of statecraft, well, it's going to be very unbalanced and it's not going to have all the tools that it needs to try to influence the world. So I think it's both of those parts, you know, resourcing and respecting and then working on how do we get that coordination, not doing the same things, because these are very different tools, development tools, diplomacy tools, defence tools are different tools, mm. using them appropriately in a complementary way to achieve what you wish. And I can see a terrific question here from Christian Wells, and it is, how has democratic decline and authoritarian consolidation in Southeast Asia, particularly in the Mekong region, influenced or altered the Australian government's approach towards civil military relations in the region? Um, I'm certainly not an expert on the Mekong, but I'll, I'll turn to you, Sharon, firstly, because you would have some intersection with this, wouldn't you, through the, the Mekong Australia partnership? Yeah, look, um... In this, in our, in our paper too, though, we also mentioned the, the freedom rankings for the countries in um, the ASEAN region, and and um, we noted the, um, you know, the change in in authoritarian consolidation in those freedom ratings um, is well reported. I think um, I think this approach, it, and the the approach of civil and military working together. Is, is a natural extension of working the best way we can with the best skill sets with, and helping our partners the best way we can. I mean, Southeast Asian states as sovereign nations work uh, in their own way. Um, and um, the, the military capacity building with the civil nexus is um, just a good way for us to do that capacity building. And um, particularly in that humanitarian space is very useful. Yeah, I look, I, I think it's it's critical, Sharon. I think any any of us who've worked on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations, know that uh, I think Australia does it very well. I think we do it well here, and I think we do it well in in the region. But you know, it, it's it's the mobilisation of actors, and we know certainly in, in some countries that actually it, it's. Um, local government or, or, or provincial government personnel actually take the lead, actually. Although we military and police are first responders, we know it's actually uh, the authorities invested in, in some local government officials in, in the governance models of, of some countries. And I've got another question here, but before I turn to, to Anna Kate 
Braithwaite's question on ASEAN. I just also note that, you know, in theory, this is this is all great stuff. And, and certainly we can work to, towards better, better whole of government coordination and coherence of planning at the Australian end. But there are a few impediments, aren't there, Melissa? Like we, we discussed in the launch um, last month, I've, if I'm not mistaken, was it January, our, our launch that, you know, military personnel and police personnel, Sharon, they, they have posting cycles. Of course, there are other impediments around uh, official development assistance that can uh, can't be uh, expended on on serving military personnel if they're not in civilian roles. There are a range of range of, of, of barriers that we you know we would need to to consider in uh, moving forward. But I'll turn to Anna Kate Braithway. The question is: Do you think? Oh, can, the can I come in on Christian sure, sure, before Melissa, we, we move on? Because I, I, I think it's a fascinating question, and I I would like to respond because. I, yeah. I think that broader context of, of democratic decline and authoritarian consolidation that is causing Australian policymakers great, great, you know, concern. Um, I think Australia is very careful about how it expresses that concern, but I have no doubt in my mind at all about what Australia wants in the region, which is a stable, open region um, with good governance. Um, if you look at something like, you know, what has happened in Myanmar in the last year since the coup, that is an absolute disaster for the country, for its people. I, I cannot see any winners at all in that situation. Um, and so from that perspective, I mean, Australia has a really strong interest in good governance um, across the region. Now, the question is, how do you do that? You know, where Australia has to... We, we are in a region where I think it's only one of the countries around us is currently rated as um, fully free on the Freedom House Index. So we live in a region where there are different levels of authoritarianism from the extremely troubling to the, you know, more or less functional. Um, so what can we do to try to help promote and, and strengthen an open and safe area. Now, we've talked a lot about sort of specific civil military um, things we can do, and I think they're great. Um, the other thing that came out of the paper was what more Australian civil society can do to work with civil society in the region, that um, there are a lot of links there already. Um, we have strong diaspora populations, for example, um, in Australia who have links back to Southeast Asian civil society, and that there are routes there where we can we can try to help strengthen the space available for civil society in ways that, you know, perhaps are not not so confrontational that they will be um, that they will be counterproductive. Put it in those terms. Yeah, and I think Melissa, at a, at a practical level, from my experience, when you when you put everyone in the same room, you know, a range of actors from you know NGOs, you know, civil society organisations, civilian government personnel, security forces, you know, that they generally they get on you know very well, and they you know relate to each other. It breaks down some of those cultural uh, barriers, and, and then and then they establish community of practice and networks that they can literally pick up the phone or more often WhatsApp each other when they really need. And we've seen some very positive outcomes from some of our courses that uh, University of Queensland's delivered. So um, I'll go to a question. There's two questions now. Um, so Anna, I'll, I'll just go to Anna, and then Ram had some earlier internet connection issues. So Anna Kate, do you think ASEAN will continue to decline in relevance in terms of transnational governance? And if so, what do you think needs to change for it to stay uh, relevant? So I'll turn to you, uh, Melissa, firstly, and then Sharon on that one. Thank you. I suppose the question is relevant to whom? Um, you know, it's relevant to its members, it's relevant to the citizens of ASEAN. Um, I think external uh, parties will always be frustrated by the, 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 the way that ASEAN works, its consensus-based model, its speed, um, its very strong system of non-interference. Um, all of those things will probably frustrate many people, uh, but I think it remains and will remain um, very, very relevant to the ASEAN members, to their citizens. Um, and from Australia's perspective, we put, uh, we put 
ASEAN very high in our list of, um, of bodies to connect with. So in the last year, for example, Australia has signed a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN. That's the first that ASEAN has signed with any of its dialogue partners. Um, and we're really putting a lot behind that. So I think Australia is showing that it still considers ASEAN extremely relevant um, in communicating and connecting with the populations of the members. Thanks, Sharon. Tra relevance and transnational governance and what do you think needs to change for it to stay relevant? Look, I, I concur with, with what Melissa has, has said there. I mean, my experience with ASEAN, just for example, dealing with what we're, we're talking about, um, you know, Vietnam, for example, is sponsoring a paper, paper on, um, you know, those communication protocols that are needed across um, ASEAN in the event of of um, disasters, natural disasters, emergency um, uh, emergency events. Uh, the, the work that ASEAN doing would be complementary to the sort of capacity building that we're talking about in this program. So I, I think that um, the relevance and that, that partnership that Australia has is a very, a very positive thing in the region. And I think certainly um, Australia works very closely and through uh, ASEAN mechanisms. Uh, for example, the ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting. Um, there are other uh, fora that, that, that Australia works very closely with ASEAN on. And I think in policy terms, uh, it's often reaffirmed, you know, certainly by Australia, but not only Australia, by Japan and, and other countries, the US, other key states about the, about the importance of ASEAN and cent centrality, despite some disappointments and criticisms, uh, you know, in response to ASEAN's response to Myanmar and some consensus position, particularly on South China Sea issues. Um, I'll turn to Ram now. So Ram's question was, from your perspective, uh, is there a possibility for Australia to contribute developing the military capabilities of Southeast Asian states to deal with non-traditional security issues, such as natural disasters and floodings? Several ASEAN states still rely on military forces as responders to non-traditional security events, as we acknowledged uh, at the beginning. Um, Sharon, over, over to you. Uh, can we still I, contribute? I, I, absolutely. I, I mean, I think the, the, the reality is the military is the first responder in those situations and, and they bring very, very key skills. And you've got to remember that in a lot of the Southeast Asian nations, you know, the military were like the, the parent organisation to policing, which is the civil power that would, would, would complement along with, the, um, you know, humanitarian efforts in the, in the event of a natural disaster. So um, uh, I absolutely think that there needs to, to be both. I mean, we, we are wanting to assist the, the Southeast Asian nations in, in a way that works for them. Yeah, look, I think that's important. Over to you, Melissa. Yeah, look, I, I agree with that. I, I think I think looking at the what came out of the paper, I'd say that we saw military forces as first responders as, as that's almost the default. That's what is going to happen if nothing is done to try to build up other capacity. And so we saw that the distinctive contribution Australia could make would be helping build up the non-military capacities, working out what are the other elements that need to be part of this? Building those up, helping bring those into the conversation and modelling that ourselves. So I, I think that's what we saw, expanding rather than trying to replace, expanding the group of, of that's involved. Yeah, and I think uh, also, you know, as a former defence policy pra practitioner um, and someone who's been posted into the region, I think defence, it's hard to emulate, even obviously not even with the police forces, you know, the military strategic lift, the air and maritime strategic lift. Uh, you know, you think helicopters, you know, you think landing platform docks that can deliver humanitarian assistance. Uh, you, you think about C2, which is common to the police as well, command and control, logistics logistics expertise and and those chain very effective uh, chains of command but as you've said Melissa rightly so it's also about building that that civilian capacity and engendering 
this uh, you know familiarity I think but between all the the key actors now something that you said Sharon I want to pick up with both you and Melissa uh, is is the importance and it's one of those first principles in in our paper is about working with Southeast Asian states in ways that are important to them now in the paper we contended very strongly that 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 our relationship Australia's engagement with Southeast Asia or relationship shouldn't be seen the, through the prism of, of, of major power rivalries and particularly Sino-US, the US-China rivalry. So I'll turn to you, Melissa. I mean, why was this important? I mean, is there a sense in Southeast Asia you think that we, we're only dealing with, with them because we're concerned about the China threat? It, that could be there in some places. I, I, mean, I think we've got to be very careful not to let that take root as an idea. Um, I think there, there's always a danger that if we're talking a lot about great power competition, that the region might see that that's the only thing that's motivating us. And I think we need a quite different narrative, which talks about our shared future, that we have shared interest, common problems. We need to work together on those rather than us being I don't know, a bit of an outsider looking in. And I, I think that is a change in narrative, even when Australia you know, has made some very, very positive statements. Um, there's, there's almost been that sense of, well, we're a helpful outsider. And so we've been pushing this idea, no, we're an invested insider. We, these are common problems for all of us and we need to deal with them together. And I, I think that's the framing you want. Um, not, that, not that we're seeing the region as an arena for great power competition. Sharon, did you want to comment on that as well? No, no, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it, it, the broader security um, issues, wh whether it's um, uh, counterterrorism, uh, you know, narcotics and, and the, the, the problems society in both Southeast Asia and Australia have, I think, you know, we need to take all of those things into account and stay focused on, on working together as partners because all of those security issues go across borders. Uh, they're not our problem. They're not Southeast Asia's problems uh, 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 solely. They're a collective problem. Yeah, and look, in my experience, Sharon, and I, I want to hear your insights here. I mean, I think there's a real hunger in, in the region for, for more Australian, you know, capacity building assistance, you know, provision of professional uh, training programs. That's certainly the impression I get with Indonesia, for example, Indonesia's Coast Guard, uh, Bar Kamla, you know, they're, they're hungry for more. Is that your experience, Sharon, both in, in, in Jakarta and through the Mekong partnership? Look, um, a lot of the Southeast Asian nations are signatories to, you know, international conventions on best practice. They, they understand um, they're getting their money markets solid, is, um, brings trade and stability and prosperity for their people. They, they um, appreciate the assistance that Australia does in the capacity building on, you know, um, helping with those systems improvements and listening to how they fit into their respective departmental structures which which they're all everyone is different but but working together to help systemize approach Australia is very well regarded in being a, a you know a sister in that sort of capacity building so I think you're right um, Greta I think there is um, a hunger for more and, and certainly um, hardening that environment against crime and security threats is is good for us as well as good for Southeast Asia. Melissa, last comment before we wrap up. Yeah. Well, I find that interesting, I have to say, that we're seen as a palatable partner in so many ways. I mean, what I would look at is something like the Prospero program in Indonesia, which places um, senior Australian bureaucrats within the Indonesian system um, and, you know, can work closely with colleagues. Um, you try and imagine someone else doing that. I mean, could China do that? Could the US do that? No, that would be seen as highly inappropriate, you know, but Australia, apparently we're, we're friendly enough, we're non-threatening enough that that sort of capacity building, we'll share some of the things we know, we'll share some of the things that worked for us, that's actually accepted. 
Um, and, and maybe it means we need to change our view of ourselves a little. I, I don't think Australia often thinks of itself as a sort of regulatory superpower, you know, that we actually have some things that work really well from our financial regulations to our policing to, you know, um, to, to so many different areas where we actually have something to offer um, in a spirit of partnership. Uh, so I think that's a, a really wonderful opportunity we have and something that we should keep building on. Yeah, absolutely, Melissa. And I think, you know, many Australians wouldn't be aware of the breadth and depth of engagement that, uh, you know, that uh, we conduct with Southeast Asia and you talk about embedded personnel and there's a whole range of, of issues. So I would commend our audience today to go on the AP4D website or jump on Australian Outlook if you want a, a, some briefer analysis on the um the civil military options paper. Um, I think it's a terrific job that AP4D and some, some great contributions by experts like Sharon. So I'd like you to join me in thanking firstly, Melissa Conley Tyler. Thank you very much this evening for your time. And Sharon Cowden, thank you very much for, for your insights and, and joining us, uh, you know, given the circumstances in, in Brisbane at the moment. Um, for uh, our audience, please stay tuned for Australian Institute of International Affairs events, both in Queensland uh, and beyond. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll close the session tonight. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Good night. And thank, thank you, you for organising, Greta. Thank, thank you, you again.